So hi everyone, my name is Nicola Gonzalez. I work for the Schaeffer Group, which is a European group that supplies a wide range of instruments in Europe. And I came from the French office. I'm here, so this is the map of the different offices. We have offices in Germany, Italy, France, Switzerland. But I'm here to talk with you about a new uh, technology, which is uh, Saloviva. It's a uh, uh, Saloviva Hyperspectral Imaging uh, Microscope, which is being currently used to observe, spectrally quantify, and map nanoscale entities in complex matrices without using any kind of fluorescent labeling. So there's actually two main components in this technology. There's an optical part, which is based on dark field microscopy, and there's a spectral part, which is based on uh, hyperspectral uh, microscopy. The optical part, it's dark field microscopy. In dark field, what you do is you eliminate the sample at an oblique angle so that the incident light does not enter the objective. The only light that enters the objective is the light that is being uh, reflected, diffused by the samples. So we have a, um, a high signal to noise ratio with dark background. And what Saliva has accomplished is usually you have to tightly focus tiny par optical parts. There's a huge loss of lights. And uh, Saliva has accomplished is uh, produce a dark field um, condenser that is preset very precisely. And so you have an, an increase, a sevenfold increase in the light intensity that goes into the focal plane. So if we compare um, the normal dark field optics and the saliva dark field optics with 240 nanometers uh, latex nanoparticles, you can still, still see them in, in, in conventional dark field optics, but with the saliva, it's much better. But if you go lower, like 50 nanometers go nanoparticles, you can clearly see them with, uh, with our optics, but with the normal conventional dark field op optical microscopy, you, you can't. So it, this is different example of what other nanomaterials would look like with uh, our optics. Top left, it's 20 nanometers silver nanoparticles. Uh, bottom left, it was 45 nanometers liposomes. And you have on the right aggregated uh, carbon nanotubes. But seeing the nanoparticles in solution is great, but you want to make sure that once you put them in cells in tissue, they are actually there. And this is where, in combination with the, um, the optical part, we, we need to make sure spectrally that uh, what we see are your nanoparticles. So this spectral part is based on hyperspectral imaging system. This is a um, um, technology that has been used for decades for geospatial studies for crops, for instance. And uh, Saliva put this onto a microscope, basically, uh, and provide with a set of analysis tools that is being suited for uh, mapping nanoscale entities. So how does it work? Once the light enters the objectives, at the entrance of the spectrometers, you have a slit that just selects a thin portion of the field of view. And then you have a diffraction grating that decomposes the light with two nanometer spectral resolution and a camera that picks that decomposition. So you have one, you record one pixel row at a time, and then you scan the whole field of view. So you have a spectral uh, acquisition uh, on the whole field of view, and you have spectral data on each pixel from between 400 nanometers and 1,000 nanometers. And in combination with the dark field optics, uh, you have a much better uh, noise to, uh, you have less noise. The, on the left, it's the conventional dark field optics combined with the high spectral, the, the, the hyperspectral uh, making system. And on the, on the right, you have the new one. And so you can see it's, it's, it's less noisy. So when you have those nanoparticles, what we do is we build what we call a, uh, a spectral library. So it's a collection of spectra from your nanoparticles, and it will be the unique spectral signatures of your nanomaterials. So this is, um, I think it was silver nanoparticles. Yes, silver nanoparticles, 20 nanometers. And Pixel by pixel, you have uh, spectral information. So we collect the spectra from one particle to another, and so on, like this. 
And all of those spectra, we'll we serve them in, into a one spectra library. And we use that spectral library to uh, confirm the presence of nanomaterials in cells or tissue, for instance. So this is the case of gold nanoparticles, 25 nanometers ish. And this was uh, can cancerous lung cells. So on the left, the control cells. And on the right, the cells uh, that have been incubated with the, the, the 25 nanometers gold nanoparticles. You can see, if you compare the two of them, you can see there's some red dots on the right that were not there on the left. So one could think that these are your nanoparticles, and they are, but how the idea of, of the saliva uh, microscope is to confirm that it is actually your nanoparticles. So we build the spectral library of the nanoparticles, and we are looking for that information into the exposed samples. So we do the same acquisition. We have, again, the hyperspectral uh, image of your uh, exposed cells, so to speak. And we look for that spectral library in each single pixel. And when there's a match, we curve that pixel in red, for instance. And so we confirm the location of the gold nanoparticles. And we do that without using any kind of recent labeling. On the bottom left, it's a, it's a, a, a mean spectral average of the, of the, the, the spectral response from the, the cell. I think the cell is in white, yes. And the, nanopart the gold nanoparticle outside the cell, um, like in solution, and the nanoparticle inside of the cells. And so we can differentiate between the nanoparticles and the cell because we can spectrally differentiate them, basically. This is another example uh, of application with carbon nanotubes. Again, we build a spectral library, uh, the unique spectral response of the, uh, the unique spectral signature of the carbon nanotubes. And we look for that spectral signature onto the exposed samples, and we map them. Uh, that does not necessarily only work with nanoparticles. This was uh, a study with uh, Dr. Robinson's and again, we build the unique spectral signature of doxorubicins, and we look for it into exposed cells. And when there's a match, we uh, color the pixel in red, in red, for instance. Other applications are in when you are producing your nanomaterials. Uh, for instance, this was gold nanoparticles and two different sample batch. One is different state of aggregation, you can see it on, uh, through the eyepiece. Uh, and the second batch, m m much more monodisperse nanoparticles. And spectrally, you can see the difference too. Uh, with monodisperse nanoparticles, the spectral output of each nanoparticle is very consistent from uh, one nanoparticle to the next. But on, on the sample with uh, different state of aggregation, the spectra is all over the place. Another um, example of application is this was a blind study. So we were given three samples, and we were not being told much about them, A, B, C. So we put them on the slides and record the spectral response of those nanoparticles. And A and C, left and right, spectrally they are the same. B, it's, it's slightly different. And the only thing that is different is that these are the same nanoparticles, but the one on the middle has a, a, a peg coding. So this can also be used to confirm the presence of a, a certain coding from batch to batch, from nanoparticles to nanoparticles. And what's next? Well, next it will be the, the 3D. Uh, it's uh, one of the first pictures of the 3D. So it's uh, the same idea is, is being able to confirm and locate the nanoparticles without using any kind of resonance labeling. So in this case, it used the, uh, the patented dark field optics, and uh, it makes uh, optical slices. And there's an algorithm that reconstructs the, uh, uh, the 3D image. The only thing that was stained in this case were the nucleus with that piece. But the nanoparticles were not stained. So the idea is, is these two uh, technology work in combination. So you record the 3D 
image of your system and you look at the, loca um, at the position of your nanoparticles and you see one that is inside the cells and then you move to that Z position and you do a hyperspectral acquisition and you confirm spectrally that uh, that particle is indeed your liposomes or uh, nanoparticle or gold or whatever. And it, it's so compatible with the hyperspectral imaging system. So in conclusion, the saliva spectral imaging system allows you to observe nanomaterial in complex matrix, uh, cells, tissue, uh, confirm spectrally the presence of those nanomaterials, and map the location uh, without using any kind of fluorescence labeling. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nicholas. Any question to his presentation? Yes, please. Um, would uh, your Cytoviva technique be able to look at the, um, how do you say, when a, a liposome is expulsing the drug? Did, could you observe this dynamic? That, that has been done before. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not that easy, but uh, yes, we can track that. We can construct uh, uh, an experiment design that allows you to track that. Because yesterday it was the comment that uh, it takes uh, sometimes a long time yes. until the drug is released and yes. causes obviously problems. Yes, absolutely, yes. Okay, and thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for the talk on the hyperspectral imaging. I was wondering how your library takes account into the differences of the aggregation state you were setting with the silver. It's, it's in solution. In, in cells, uh, currently we have no way of saying it, is the, if the nanoparticles are aggregated or not. Usually they are aggregated in specific places in the, in the cells, but we cannot tell you uh, if they are not or not, basically. Yeah. I, I mean, the optical resolution of such system is, is around 20 nanometers for nanoparticles. Uh, so it's, uh, if there's a high state of aggregation, we will mat a bunch of them uh, in, in the cells, but we cannot tell you these are really aggregates or not. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. <coughs> Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, regarding, for example, the question that uh, he made before regarding liposomes, mm -hmm. do you have to fix them in order to focus them properly or they can be in suspension moving around? The liposomes? For example, or nanoparticles, anything that um, is in suspension. When we put them in solution, uh, then solution and I, uh, I apply maybe one microliter between a slide and a cover slip, Usually they, they stop moving because they uh, are being stuck at uh, the cover slip interface. Okay, they are sedimentated somehow. Yes, yes. Uh, for cells, they don't need to be fixed. It's, uh, it's uh, easier, but uh, they don't need to be fixed. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we are at the end of this uh, session, so is there any other question uh, from the audience to one of the speakers? Everybody looking for coffee. Huh? We, over, we have overdone the time a little bit, but as the coffee break is now, I think in about five or ten minutes, I think we are very much in time. I would like to thank the speakers uh, to being here and you uh, attending the sessions. So uh, enjoy your coffee break and a little bit of sunshine, and we see you in the next session. Okay, thank you. <laughs>